Okay, welcome to the module on physical security systems, design and evaluation of performance and objectives. This is the third time that I've had the opportunity of teaching this class to North Carolina State and others, and I hope it's an enjoyable experience. I am a vulnerability analyst and security engineer for Oak Ridge National Laboratory. I've worked at Los Alamos National Laboratory and with Sandia, Pantex, Lawrence Livermore, and a few other national labs and so I've been with the Department of Energy through the National Lab System for approximately 10 years now. That's gone quickly and so I hope you enjoy this module. Uh, I enjoy teaching it and uh, let's get going. Many of the people that we talk to about security systems have this mistaken notion that very little design and evaluation goes into putting up a wall or putting up a containment system or putting up a access control system and nothing could be further from the truth. Every step needs to be planned and uh, I like this quote because it shows that you put up a computer system or a security system or a wall or a door or a lock and then because it's out in the open people have access to it. People can see it. People can use it. Then the redesign and evaluation starts again once something is deployed. Uh, one thing I don't want the class to walk away with is the notion of security by obscurity. That is, if you think you can hide portions of your security system, you think you are safe. When, in fact, nothing can be further from the truth. Because eventually, someone, whether it be an insider or an employee or someone with malcontent, will want to disrupt your system. And so it's best to evaluate your systems for performance within a design standard. The overview for this course is, for the module one, we'll talk about some security terms that I consider important. We'll go through the difference between risk management and vulnerability assessment. And vulnerability assessment is actually the arm of evaluation for security engineering. We'll talk about how to characterize a facility, or that is what pieces of information we need in order to complete a characterization or an understanding of a facility, a threat definition, and a target evaluation. And the targets are the assets that we maintain that we may want to protect. Module two will be the design and evaluation process. We'll actually walk you through some of the steps. We'll take a sampling of a couple of the technologies used and look at them a little bit in depth and then go into the detection, delay, and response subjects that we investigate uh, individually to come up with delay values and uh, detection probabilities. And then we'll talk a little bit more about the vulnerability assessment process and walk through a pathway assessment. Are you asleep yet? This is the first term that I had. I'm actually a graduate of a, of a security engineering program at Arizona State University. And this is the first slide of the first subject that was presented to us. And that is, there is a major difference between safety and security. And I want you never, ever to think of the two the same way again. We have many politicians who unfortunately believe that if you are safe, you are secure, and vice versa. Safety systems are not security systems. I want you to think of an analogy. The guardrail at the top of the hill is not the same as the ambulance at the bottom. Emergency response is not security. Asset recapture or recovery is not security. Police forces are not security. Legal proceedings and prison time are not security. The security of which I talk is the prevention of malevolent human intent of an adversary against your system. And it is meant to endure, that is the system, is meant to endure an insult. Otherwise, why is it designed? You design it not against things, but against people. So the people in this classroom and the people who hear this course in the future, I want you to remember, whatever is the worst that you could do to our system is hopefully the thing that we design against. And so when you hear safety, we're safe in our environment. We've created nuclear safety. 
don't think nuclear security, don't think asset security. The two are distinctly dis different. The event example is of a safety event, of course you can see there, we've got flood, we've got fire, earthquake, national, natural or human accidents, and earthquakes. Now what you should be thinking of, well, what if you have an adversary who uses a safety incident to bring about a security incident? The designers of security systems should keep that in mind. Unfortunately, we have two different theories of how this should go. Um, the safety designers of systems design objects to fail safe. That is in direct contrast to fail secure. And I'll give you an example. Fire protection doors. What do they do in an emergency? They open or they're accessible to people. If you have a critical facility, do you want those doors open with secure interests? No, because that allows two-way passage back in. I'll give you another example. When I was a uh, security administrator at Los Alamos, they had in our $20 million uh, security system uh, room with all of the computer components, they had installed water sprinklers in the event of fire. How brilliant is that? So there's a good example of two systems not being uh, synced up. Your job is to make sure that you have the safety regulations and requirements met while at the same time providing equal or greater levels of security. Now, when we talk about security, you'll notice these events are always caused by a person or person's intent on doing you harm. The industrial espionage, the facility attacks, the insider theft, the employee strike, the material diversion, all of these have a threat basis. That is, a person on the inside or outside wants for economic, theological, or political motivations to do something to you, whether to disrupt your business or to steal something for later resale. It's always a person that you design against, and generally a person using tools. Now we'll go into the safeguards realm. When you hear of safeguards, there's that safe word in there again, which I don't like in the term, but we live with it. Safeguards is this wrapper, this integrated process and program to protect assets using a unified strategy of outside in. In the case of special nuclear material that we deal with here and at many other national laboratories, we have multiple layers of defense, and it includes anything from engineered systems to more administrative systems, such as personnel control, badges, access control on doors and systems that maintain that, as well as the accounting methods necessary to account for all the material. When we talk operations, we have to do something with this stuff. We have to do assessment of it. We have to change its form. We have to mold it. We have to move it. We have to record it. And so another problem that we have is that we have these really expensive assets that need to be moved, that need to be shipped, that need to be touched and manipulated. That's in direct contrast to the objectives of security. If we wanted a really secure system or for our materials, we'd bury them 10 miles under the ground and let no one touch them. But that's not going to happen because we need to use uh, we need to modify it for operations. Okay, here's where we get into the overall design objectives. We try to integrate our systems so that all of our policies, procedures, engineered systems work together flawlessly, hopefully, which I've never seen yet, but it's, it's a, certainly a motherhood and apple pie statement. When you get down to those last four bullets, that's the, the security is the layered wrapper or envelope, what I mentioned for safeguards. But we talk about the last three, the protection and defense in depth. These are critical to understand if you want to work in the security engineering field because if you have a system that has the same outer door as it does inner door, that is not protection in depth. If you install a $25 Home Depot door on the outside of your facility, to achieve protection in depth, you need to change the systems that you use 
closer in to the asset and make it more difficult for an adversary. They must bring different or more tools to the fight and it delays them uh, for an additional period of time so your response forces can set up. So I've seen in some of the systems that we've installed <clears throat> and some of, as we, we go out to other places internationally, we see places that don't understand this concept and they will install a $20,000 vault door or even a million dollar vault door in some cases on a sheetrock wall and you question the, the reliability of that system or if any analysis was done at all. The second is you want to minimize the consequence of component failure. That is, if, for any of you who have done reliability engineering, you know that two redundant systems are better in a critical system than are one. Three are actually better. You can get out to three sigma on, on your reliability. And so if one system fails, you want another one to stand in and back it up. And I'll give you a couple of examples of that. Backup power generation. In a critical facility, you'll absolutely not want to trust facility power 100% of the time. The second, guards. How often do people call in sick? How many guards does it take to staff one 24-hour post? And it's not just three. In fact, it's multiples of three that are required in an organization to staff one 24-hour post. Moving forward, balanced protection. One of the evaluations that we make, and I'll show you what's called an adversary sequence diagram, we describe a facility based on layers that it takes along a pathway of an adversary to reach deeper into your system. The balance comes in if you have an adversary that's making a choice, if they can break down a door or go through a wall. What are the structural characteristics of that wall or that door that they have to decide between and what tools do they have to bring? A sledge, a mallet, a jack, screwdrivers? What will allow them the easiest passage? And so using a specific pathway, using specific tools, we analyze the doors, the walls, the ceilings, the floors, the ductwork, the windows, if there are any, and make the adversary make equally bad choices if they want to progress forward. And hopefully, those choices involve similar timing. So when I say balanced protection, I mean the protection on the door is the same as the wall. The protection on the ceiling is the same as the ductwork. Hard to do, actually. Now, I hear another word thrown around quite a bit, deterrence. We can deter an adversary, and it's all fine and good. And we probably have, in real terms, deterred an adversary from hurting us. In many cases, both outside the United States and within, a criminal who walks up to a jewelry case may be able to see visible video cameras. They may see glass break sensors on the inside of the case. They may see an armed guard outside. What type of a deterrent factor are those things to a determined adversary? And I see a couple of you shrugging. Good, you should shrug. Nobody knows what the deterrent value of a security system is because it's from the perspective of the adversary. What have you done that causes an adversary not to attack? I don't know. In how many cases do you get an adversary's perception of what your system does or does not do? It's actually quite rare. And so that's another uh, basis for uh, judging a security system based on its performance criteria. So an adversary won't attack if they think it's unattractive. It's like, eh, I'm not going to touch that. My chances of winning are not that great. I'll move to something else. I'll move to an easier target. There's a jewelry store down the street. That is, the cost to attack, they may not be successful, so they'll walk away. But that stated, you may have a great security system with many visible or invisible elements. A determined adversary, unfortunately, that really wants your asset will attack anyway, regardless of what system you have in place. Maybe there's a political motivation to embarrassing you. And even if they don't succeed, they've succeeded in a manner of speaking. Or they'll call in more of their friends to help so their chances of success improve. Um, in most cases, the adversary may not know 
and you may not know what your adversary knows, but you must assume that the adversary has a lot of information about your system and may attack anyway. In each of these cases, the adversary may attack and your deterrence value, you can't measure it based on their perce perception. Another problem is that we don't have a lot of data behind successful attacks on our system or unsuccessful attacks. We have a lot of example of terrorist bombings in different locations with different modes, but that's not the same as a critical system. <coughs> because we lack information, we can't judge what they know and what they can do. And so again, we must do performance testing on our own system. Third bullet down, reliance on deterrence alone. I was president of a homeowners association in Arizona and what they wanted to do, someone kept breaking the front gate. They would ram the front gate with their vehicle and get in and for any of you who know vehicle gates, they're incredibly expensive to repair, $2,000 to $4,000 a pop every time someone decides to do something against it. So the homeowners association board voted to put in a surveillance camera. There was one problem, there was no one to monitor it, the best that they could do is watch the footage after an event occurred. Is that security? Absolutely not. That's criminal prosecution. And so it, it provided negligent or negligible security value. One study showed that as you sometimes can provide these visible security elements, guards, dogs, cameras, gates, bars, that it actually makes the asset look more attractive because whatever it is you're protecting, hey, they're spending money on protecting it, so must be really good what's inside. The study showed that it was indeterminate, the value of increasing security measures based on perception from the adversary's view. Okay, and for those of you who think there's a magic bullet out there for any engineered system, if you think technology can solve your problems, as Bruce Schneier says, he's actually an IT professional, but the quote is applicable to security as well. You don't understand your security systems, and you don't understand technology if you think a technology can solve it. On this graphic, this is the difference or the relationship between risk management and vulnerability assessment. I want to point out a couple of things. For the risk management organization, this could be a risk manager in a corporation or a company, or even headquarters staff of the Department of Energy, but they must make decisions based on market conditions, based on budget cycles, based on perceived risk in the environment. For the boxes that you see on the far bottom left, market, credit, strategic, operational, and liquidity, those are all economic and business continuity elements of risk. The space that safety and security sit in is under hazard risk. And you see lower right hand side, safety and security. Underneath security you have a couple of specialized elements that define the threats. That is the security engineering and the risk assessment portion, which is the vulnerability assessment. Unique to hazards is the fact that you're actually preventing malevolent human action against you or a direct facility attack, be it theft, industrial espionage, or an active shooter, or a staff management dispute. Those organizations deal with a unique type of hazard. And this isn't liquidity. This isn't getting your money out of a bank account and buying another asset or determining what market conditions are, are foreseeable in the near future to make an investment. This is protection of your static or intellectual capital within your own walls, within your own doors. And this can include executive protection. One great problem that I see in the security industry is that, unfortunately, we use as a basis of moving forward that which we've seen in the past. In legal terms, it's called precedent. And that's wonderful. It's a wonderful thing to do, to look backwards and say, this has happened in the past, it may happen in the future, great. If you always design security systems based upon what has happened in the past, you will lose every time. The trick is to anticipate what your adversaries could do to you and stop them using techniques that hinder their forward progress. It's best to look around and know your surroundings. 
Here's an introduction to the design and evaluation process. This was actually pioneered by Sandia National Laboratories, and they invested millions of dollars in a design and evaluation process for physical security. And it's broken up into four main areas. You see on the furthest most left quadrant the determine the protection system objectives. It starts out with characterizing your facility, or that is documenting and understanding all that your facility is and does to assess anything from procedures to the physical location to the vulnerability to theft to, as I mentioned, direct facility attack. Then you define the threats to that facility. That is, you go out and chart the space. You do a survey, much like a market survey, for the threats that you could encounter. You say, what would their objectives be? How many of them will there be to attack? What tools would they use? What's their motivation? Where will they go? What will they do if they do get their hands on my asset? Could it be a sabotage scenario where they just want me to look bad? Will they plan a virus in my computer systems? Or is their main objective just to kill the manager? All of those things are important when you determine what a threat is. And then, of course, at that point, the other risk management organizations have a say because security systems are awfully expensive. And at times, they must prioritize their objectives. And you may choose not to deal with the disgruntled employee as much as you would deal with the person who's trying to spray paint on your wall. I'm not saying one is better than the other. I'm saying that management has to make decisions to which is more likely and which is the one to deal with and can do most harm. Third, you see target identification. Because after all, sometimes the target will determine the type of adversary and the motivations that the adversary will have for coming after you. You must determine what it is that you have that could be valuable and protect it. The other elements, the design, the physical protection system, the second box over on the top. Underneath, you see detection, delay, and response. We'll get into those in module two, as we will analyze the physical protection system. We'll investigate a few models that you can use. And then, of course, you either finalize the design at that point or you reevaluate. In my experience, you're always evaluating or reevaluating because you find a weakness in your system, which is called a vulnerability, and they exist everywhere. In fact, even systems that you consider safe and secure are vulnerable. It's just either you or the adversary hasn't found them yet. Now, if we were to have a critical asset, it could be nuclear material. It could be a design of a new Intel chip that they don't want anyone to know about. It could be a secret design for toilet paper. And it could be valuable. And so what would you want to do with that? How would you protect that asset? Here is a facility based on a Department of Energy regulation or sets of regulations that indicate how you could potentially protect a critical asset, in this case, special nuclear material. You see, and I'm using my laser pointer over here, entry control facilities from outside of the facility inward. The Department of Energy uses what's called a PIDAS, or Perimeter Intrusion Detection and Alarm System. This is a series of two fences with parallel detection systems inside of them. I've depicted here cameras, which are not themselves a detection system. They are an assessment system. You see uh, active microwaves or uh, bi-static microwaves that transmit microwave energy and use Doppler shift to detect a person or vehicle moving through the pattern. Not shown, but it's a, an important element of security systems, an invisible underground detection system called ported coaxial cable, which creates a magnetic field that any dis disturbance of any molecular significance with ferromagnetic mass or water, which humans are full of, uh, walking over the, the pitus bed will be detected. Why do we use two systems? Why not one? One can fail. You can, you can disrupt. Any security system can be defeated. And any one technology can be defeated much easier than two simultaneously. 
And so if and when a detection goes off, the cameras capture that and in a central alarm station, which is hopefully somewhere on site, in this case we assume it's here or there, the guard will be able to see the activity and then dispatch a response. Electronic systems are wonderful at doing detection. Humans are excellent at doing response. I've seen a lot of businesses confuse the two and think that they can use automated systems to do response or humans to do detection. And unfortunately, humans lose interest after about 15 minutes on the job. It's why we rotate guards frequently. It's why we move our positions. It's why we try to stay alert. There's been multiple studies that said, you, sit down in front of this monitor. There will be a security event in 15 minutes. Less than 40% of the people caught a security event while watching a monitor after 15 minutes. After 45 minutes, less than 20% caught that same event. We're, humans are terrible detectors. And so, moving inward with our system, if they were able to breach that fence, <coughs> make it through the detection zone, and into this area. This is what's known as the protected area. We protect the assets in this area. And it's kind of an exclusion zone. We want no one in who, without authorization. And so there is a legal authorization to stop or detain anyone within this area without authorization. Moving further inward and closer to our assets, I don't know if you can see it, but that says SNM vault, Special Nuclear Material Vault. And so they have a variety, the adversary does, a variety of pathways to take moving into this facility if they want the asset. They can breach the fence. They can come in through the vehicle or personnel portals. They can try an emergency door. They can jump from an airplane at 14,000 feet and parachute in. All of those options and more are available to the adversary. But one thing that should be obvious, and here's a, an element of protection in depth, is there's just a flimsy fence on the outside. It's a property barrier. It's a notification area where they usually hang pictures on it and say, don't come in here. You will be arrested, shot, whatever. Then closer in here, uh, the deeper they get, then they have to start bringing some heavy tools. They have to breach a wall. They have to force their way through an, em through an employee or through an a entry portal. They have to up the ante. They have to show more intent and use more force as they intend to go in or change tactics uh, for deceit. Because at this point, not only do they have to make it through a portal if they're trying deception as a tactic, that is, they're deceiving the guard with a valid badge or what looks like a valid badge on the outside, then as they get in here, they have to show contraband. They have to run their materials through an x-ray scanner. They have to walk through a metal detector and pass a special nuclear material scan. And so you can see how uh, we make it more selective and more difficult the closer in they get. Then in the material balance area, or MBA, they have other options. With two person rules on the outside door and a key code, deception breaks down unless they have an insider. They have to know what codes there are and have to recruit another person who also knows the code to get in the door to access the vault and then out if theft is their motivation. If sabotage is their motivation, it may be enough to sabotage the material in the vault. And, and if it's a suicide attack, they die with it. And you can see in terms of timeline how long things take. That could take much less time than getting in and getting out of this facility. This is the adversary sequence diagram that I mentioned before, or ASD. And it's the same facility, only depicted differently. So if an adversary starts off-site, they have a few options available to them. They can, on the left side, choose a helicopter insertion. Helicopter insertion carries with it the three tag, taking them to layer three, or directly into the protected area. There's no Star Trek going on here. You can't just magically appear inside the vault. It's impossible. 
they must choose one of the pathway elements to get to the next step in the path. They can choose helicopter, they can choose a personnel portal, they can choose a vehicle portal, or they can choose a fence to breach. Inside the limited area or exclusion zone, they can tunnel. They can choose the personnel portal, vehicle, or a fence again. Once they get into the protected area and to make it to the next layer, you see they have a lot of options. And each element, as I've failed to explain before, has a three-letter code associated with it. Helicopter, personnel, vehicle, fence. Material dock, personnel dock, doorway, emergency exit, ductwork, surface, surface. And you'll notice there that there are two different surfaces. One could take you right into the target area vault. The other surface is just a surface to the wall into the MBA. Each one of these has characteristics. Each one of them has a delay time and a detection probability associated with it. So if you wanted to build a diagram, this is a good way to start, to do facility characterization and understand your facility. And it will eventually become the adversary sequence diagram to which you map all of your delay times, all of your surfaces, and all of your probabilities. So that as you do pathway analysis, in this, there are probably over a thousand pathways. And it looks simple enough, but there are a thousand different pathways or more that an adversary could choose in and out of your facility. And as you develop the most likely scenarios, you'll begin to notice that there are patterns in what they will do. They want to minimize detection. They want to minimize time required to complete their objectives. And they want to do it quickly and with the minimum loss to their forces. And so this is just the same way as describing the facility as the diagram. Again, that's called an adversary sequence diagram, or ASD. Moving into facility characterization, there is a lot of information that you need to know. And in my experience, you take a team of folks with you, a team of folks who are experts, not just at vulnerability assessment, but facility procedures. You take material control and accountability folks who understand what an insider could do, a person to review policies, a person to review uh, access control, a person to review security systems, performance testers. You take an entire range and skill set basis of people so that they can understand your facility. And then you, under, you have a basis for understanding the physical conditions, that is, where is this? facility. What are the walls made of? Show me the blueprints. I need to know what every floor looks like. What are the distances in between the fence lines and the buildings? How far do they have to run down a hallway? Is there heavy equipment on site? What's the legal basis for stopping an adversary once they're detected? Do you have on-site response or do you have to call the police? What are your detection systems like? How long does it take to get the alarm? Where do the alarm pictures go? What's the probability you'll detect an adversary that weighs 125 pounds running at 20 miles an hour? Will a vehicle crashing through the fence be detected? What if someone sits on your loading dock and is paid $400 to take something that's not supposed to go in that shipment? Those are the questions that you're trying to understand as you characterize a facility, and it's not small. In fact, this will take, if you were doing a vulnerability assessment of a facility, this will probably take 60 to 65% of your time. And what you get from a manager will not be the same information that you get from a worker on the line. And you must talk to both. Because no matter what policy is, workers sometimes deviate from policy and procedure. We take the facility information and we compress it. And everything that you could conceive of knowing that could aid an adversary, would you not want to know where your boundaries are? Absolutely. It's a legal basis because you can't stop someone who's not in your boundary. If there's a dispute over where your border is, that's open to interpretation. 
Where do people come in? Do you have foliage or trees? How many buildings on site? Where's your power coming in from? Where does the runoff water go? What are those ducts like? Do you keep it clear? Is there gravel? Are there anti-vehicle measures? How many animals can get in sight? Do birds disrupt your security system? Does it rain a lot? Do you have a lot of lightning? And it may sound like a lot of foolishness, but you absolutely must know that information. And I'll give you an example. Los Alamos National Labs, sitting at about 7,000 feet altitude, has more lightning strikes than nearly any place on Earth. There's only two other places that are inhabited that, that claim as many lightning strikes. Do you think this would be a problem for a security system? Lightning strikes take out a lot of equipment frequently. So that would tell you that you need to have extra equipment and extra maintenance personnel on site to accommodate that. What does the response force do? How quickly can they get there? What adversaries are they fighting against? What weapons do they have? All of those are part of the facility characterization. Beyond that, you have to know what your facility makes and how it makes it from end to end. Diversion is a huge problem. Every step in the process, you have chemicals, heavy tools or machinery, waste products that must be accounted for. And as you move further to a finished product, the asset would become more valuable, correct? And so you'd want to protect it more and have more accountability elements. Do they close down on some days? Do they quit during holidays? Do they have maintenance cycles which affect production? Who are those maintenance people? Are they cleared to the same level? Do the people who collect your trash, are they able to get in too? Is there a two-person rule on all doors or just some? How many employees come in? Where do they come from? What are their backgrounds? Are they foreign nationals? Who are their friends and family? How long have they worked here? Then the review of the operating procedures. And I say usually this is the most intensive portion to review because you have to go through a lot of documents. For those of you who love to read highly in-depth technical manuals, um, there is a job for you out there. It's review operational procedures. And then you have to review where you get your stuff. That is, your procurement, your computers, your maintenance assets, your vehicles, shipping and receiving workflow. All of these things must be documented and understandable. And an example of that is, what happens to the computer systems that your business donates or sends out as waste when they're done using them. Hopefully they've sanitized the hard drive, but unfortunately most people don't. They put a sticker on them says, ah, this is salvage, it's gone. Everything on that hard drive is completely recoverable. Doesn't matter if they have encryption. There's only really one good way to uh, erase the data, and that's pulverize the drive. So, Moving into threat definition. This is perhaps the most exciting part because your security system should be based upon the assets you have and the threat you face, both of those two characteristics. And the reason why you do facility characterization first is to find out what you've got to start with. Security, unfortunately, is usually the afterthought or the design occurs concurrently with construction. And it's much less expensive as in a factor less expensive to design security into a system than to change it once the facility is correct or completed. And so this threat or this uh, definition from Sun Tzu is you've got to win over an adversary that you know, not one that you don't know. And so if you design a standard facility with standard walls and standard doors, Imagine your expense in replacing all of your interior and exterior access control components because you misjudge the capabilities of an adversary. Even with simple hand tools, you can defeat many doors. 
Okay, so as we move into threats and looking at what the bad guys can do to you, you have to list information. Who? Who are these guys? Are they people working on the outside who may have visual access to your operations? Or are these insiders, disgruntled employees, managers looking for a little kickback, construction workers, trash collectors, maintenance people, performance testers, guards? Or is it a combination of the two? Outsiders working in collusion with insiders. And why do they do it? Do they have an ideological, you know, are they Greenpeace, militant Greenpeace people who want to save panda bears in China? And your product is indirectly responsible for the death of their young? You know, I, I'm seeing some folks laugh. It, it's exactly what happens. And so if it's an ideological basis, what will probably be their methods and objectives? Sabotage or terrorism. If it's an economic basis, what do you think their objective will be? Disruption or theft. Personal? Sabotage, attack, murder of personnel in that facility. Disruption. Pathological? You don't know. They're freaking nuts. Y you don't know. And so in that case, you have to determine whether they're rational, nonviolent, or rational violent, or non-rational violent. And each one of those carries with it different protection standards that you will use. The non-rational violent person is unlikely to proceed along a pathway to the asset in a coherent manner. They will get into a part of the facility and then just go nuts. And they'll whack out. But the rational violent will look very much like a terrorist with an objective to your vault. Okay, our threats. We look at their potential goals. How are they going to get into our facility? Will they crash the gates with a truck? Will they detonate a bomb on the outside of our facility for disruption? and then go in some other way or use that hole they just created? Or will they try to sneak in? Will they be sneaky and try to defeat the security systems? And how likely is that? You should have a performance testing basis for your facility so that you know their probability of being successful if they do try to bridge your pitus with a ladder or try to swing over on a crane or try to jump in from an airplane or a glider. Or will they use deceit? Will they take a badge? Will they reproduce it? Will they steal one from a known employee? Will they make some of their own? And will they try to get in that way? Now we go into their number and capabilities. Their number uh, helps you understand depth and their tactics. One person is unlikely to fulfill more than two roles on any team. And so if you have a breaching or an explosives expert, or a weapons expert or a marksman, it's unlikely that one of those people alone will be able to breach all levels of your security system. So it's important to know how many it takes, what tools they have available to them. And unfortunately, if you have an industrial or a mechanical facility, you've got a lot of tools on site. You usually have some heavier equipment. You have vehicles. You have cutting tools. You have snips. You have fuels as in torches and gasolines. And so when you think of tools, you also must consider those that you already gave them when they came in. Think of the 9-11 terrorists. 18 folks armed with tools that probably cost no more than $30 get on a plane and cause trillions in damage or planes. They used tools that were available to them, the planes and the fuel on those planes. They didn't have to bring anything to the fight other than themselves and their box cutters and their training that they had. And they were resourceful. And so you must consider that what's the worst that anyone in your organization can do against you? And then multiply that by a militant extremist 
and then you have an idea of their resourcefulness and the tools that they may bring. Why is it important to know tools? Well, for two reasons. What they can breach, what they can do, but how heavy these things are. Because if they bring it, they have to pack it. They have to carry it. And if the adversary is assumed to create an explosion on the inside without a vehicle, the explosive weight is assumed at 50 pounds, someone's got to carry it, making that individual much slower than the others. Use that for your timeline analysis, that as a person comes closer in, you time them in their completion of all of the tasks. Then how much knowledge do they have? How much knowledge do they have of your system? Will you ever really know that? You don't. You have to assume quite a bit. And you assume that they know most of what's observable. And then you go out to sources. Um, in some entities, your risk manager will give it to you. They'll say, well, you know, we've got some criminal activity going on. They've, they've been looking for a chance to steal corporate records. They want to know where our source for this technology was. In fact, Apple is going through this right now. Many sources want to know where Apple products are manufactured, both legal and illegal. Apple will not divulge the manufacturing locations of its products. Why? Fear of sabotage is a huge one. I would think industrial espionage. Apple is about six months to eight months ahead of the rest of the market in their innovation for products. And if you could cut your design cycle down by six to eight months, do you imagine what that would do for your product versus another? The stakes are huge for it. And if you think a business doesn't, inv a large business doesn't involve industrial espionage against a competitor, you're dead wrong. Every single major corporation hires private investigators and people to investigate the products of its competitor using legal or sometimes illegal means. That includes going through dumpsters, being friends with an employee at a bar. That includes observing what employees do during their day. That includes taking hard drives and laptops. Not all the laptop thefts that you hear about are accidental. And so when you collect information on these potential threats, your management will sometimes give it to you. Say, let's design a system that three people trying to get in the front door with the motivation of economic sabotage. How could they economically sabotage us? Well, then you start listing the pathways and the tools and techniques that they may use. You could talk uh, to your local police forces about what crimes have been perpetuated in the past that have been reported. The FBI maintains a crime database. You could uh, use professional organizations as a basis, such as As Is Inter International, or another uh, institute called InfraGuard, which guards uh, infrastructure. They have a reporting database on uh, all attacks on critical infrastructure in the US. Or any published literature, crime stories, statistics, or any government directives. Those are usually reactive, as I mentioned, not proactive. Since this course is, has been normally presented in North Carolina, I wanted to bring this out as a potential source of credible information. This map comes from the Southern Poverty Law Center, or SPLC.org. Uh, it's an open source, and they track hate groups within specific geographic regions. Every state has um, known people who resort to violence against people, either because of race, nationality, religion, et cetera. And when I asked previous classes how many threat groups they thought were in North Carolina, and by threat I meant those willing to go to illegal extremes that were organized with 30 or more members, they said one, two, and I said no, you've got 30 that show up on here with locations. And you see many different organizations, um, Christian Identity, um, Ku Klux Klan, uh, a lot of uh, Confederate forces. Um, there are a few that 
really give me pause, those two out there on the western border. Those are Christian identity. They believe in stockpiling of guns, ammunition, explosives, with the intent to bring about the end of days as part of their theology. You'll know one of those people from um, the Oklahoma City bombing. That was his religion. So it's important to do a survey of the people that you have around you. All of these groups, neo-Nazis, uh, any of the, the white Christian supremacy groups, all of them believe in anti-government subversion, including the running of drugs, uh, weapons, to reach their aims and objectives. And those are just a few. I like this. I like this quote from the IRA uh, to Margaret Thatcher when a, she had several attempts on her life. And this one uh, was, was interesting. The note that they found listed this. We only need to be lucky once. You need to be lucky every time. The same is true for security systems. They need to be designed to withstand an insult using the threat and any tools and tactics that they could use and against multiple attacks. So once we've got this big bag of information, we know who they are, we know what they can do, we know what their motivations are, we know what tools they have, we know what training and tactics, we assume certain numbers, then we pull it all together and we create this band, this increasing potential adversary list where we increase it based on risk or damage or consequence to our facility. And as the problem gets greater, obviously we should address those. Some of the high consequence, low probability events. What if there's a 1% chance of a white Christian supremacy group attacking to get whatever it is that we have on site. If there's a 1% chance, how much should we expend on that 1%? That's up to management to decide. But if it's a credible uh, possibility, it should be addressed. Then what we do is we write a design basis threat, or DBT. We use this DBT as our cardinal document to determine what we're designing against. And our security system should be able to withstand direct attack from the design basis threat. And not only that, but should do so gracefully. Meaning, not a total collapse, but there will probably be failure points along the way, and those are understood. But we have backup systems to mitigate those, and that's why we use response. No system by itself without personnel can withstand a direct attack for long periods of time. And the safes that you buy, say document safes or fireproof safes, those safes all have listings on them like 3M20. They list how long they can withstand fire without ruining the documents inside or a, an adversary attack. Pay attention to that next time you look at a safe because they all list it. And likewise, we use our design basis threat to say how long our facility can delay an adversary prior to the response forces getting there. It matters. Seconds matter because one guard showing up is not interruption. If you have, say, three adversaries, it's unlikely that three response forces showing up are going to interrupt that adversary. Okay, at this point, once we've done our DBT, once we have our design basis, then we can start compiling the rest of the information. We say, we know what our facility is, we know what we produce, we know what we have to protect. We've got our bad guys, we know what they're capable of, we know their motivations or assume their motivations, we have our design basis threat that tells us what they could be doing bad to us. Now we take a, 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 di a deeper look into what it is that we have specifically on site. We provide a target identification or look at the assets or pathways or processes that could be of value. And interestingly enough, uh, I worked with an with a, uh, engineering and uh, technology firm 
that didn't consider one of its assets its people. And I let me quantify that statement. This firm cared more about its legal basis for operations and its continued business continuity or its current list of products, but not those people who had invented or developed them. So don't try to copyright, don't make an infringement upon what they have, but if you're an employee who helped invent that, you're free to go anytime. How stupid is that? They don't protect their employees, meaning they don't compensate or didn't compensate them to the level of the market, didn't protect the information on their hard drives. They allowed employees to take their computers home, leave them at work. They got lost or stolen, no encryption. Passwords if the employees wanted them, not necessary. Seems a little bit foolish to me that you'll protect your products but not protect those who invent your products. And as a consequence, many of their employees left the company. And guess what they did? They created competitor products against them. That company is now out of business. So as we identify targets, you've got to remember not just your assets that they can walk away with. You know, shiny metal, this created processor, this product that you're going to take to market, a new shoe. But it's also the intellectual capacity and all of the documentation that created it. So what are we going to do? We're going to use sabotage fault trees, perhaps fault tree analysis or consequence analysis or even manual listing. We're going to, you're going to give a list to your manager and you're saying, manager, write down everything that you think that we need to be protecting that is of value in this organization. What is common is if you have, say, a backup generator that's worth $100,000. What they'll do is they'll look on the paper and they'll say, hmm, $100,000. Okay, generator, $100,000. When in fact, the cost of that generator is closer to about $500,000 based on you've got to clean up the mess created from the disruption of the old one getting blown up. You have to buy a new one, which is usually more expensive than the old one. You have to pay for the labor to move the old one out, the labor to move the new one in. Then you have to test it and certify it you have to calculate the entire cost of the objects and assets that you have, not just the initial purchase or the operating cost. Okay, and then the other one you can talk about is consequence analysis. We'll get into this just a little bit. Consequence analysis is more like, give me a list of all the things that could happen that could bring you down. What would happen if the river up yonder overflowed its banks? What would happen if you lived on the coast and there was a tsunami? What would the effect be? What would the consequences be to your business? For that reason, one of the larger IT firms that I worked with had a data center that did instantaneous hot backups with their data in California, backed it up instantaneously to a data center that was running hot in Phoenix, Arizona. So if California suffered an earthquake, that data would be backed up and usable and available immediately off-site. Another quote by Sun Tzu, those who think you can just build a system or invent a system without testing it and calculating it, well, Sun Tzu had it right many, many years ago. You think that they didn't perform calculations on force protection? They did. They ran many trials before a battle to get possible outcomes. Even Napoleon did some type of consequence analysis or battle planning. Took weeks before he would engage in any battle. So when we talk about threat definitions, we define them like I talked about. We have a threat continuum, low probability, medium probability, and high probability, and then the consequence. Examples of those are if you have a low probability, high consequence events, we talked about terrorists. It's unlikely you're going to get the spectacular 9-11 terrorist attacks in the same form in the future. And as you look across time, that has been unlikely. We had a spate of uh, hijackings in the 1980s, different groups that were successful, but their tactics 
changed a little bit, mostly because they wanted larger targets and more notoriety. But what if you have a high probability, low consequence event, such as graffiti on the outside of your building? Do you deal with that directly, or do you just let it happen? What does it indicate if you've got graffiti on the outside of your building? You have a lot of other problems going on, including poor security. And you're allowing people right up to the skin of your facility, without being noticed, able to do a task of their own choosing. You have other problems than just spray paint. There's another problem that crime studies have de determined. It's called the broken window effect. Um, cars were abandoned in certain neighborhoods of unsavorable quality. And if it were a new car, it lasted two hours before being vandalized. If it were a new car with a broken windshield, it was vandalized in less than 10 minutes. So if you have a facility with a known uh, problem or error, it's likely that that will enhance the uh, perception of successful attack in the future. So we talked about target identification. This is just one method, fault tree analysis. This is how we walk through and look at our processes for faults, or that is, how can a disruption be made? And there's notation of which I've, I've mentioned. In the upper left-hand corner, you've got the basic event. It's a circle with the large rectangular box on top. That's where it all starts out. That's where you begin your analysis. And it looks like a tree, inverse tree. It starts at the bottom and then works up. You have gates over on the right-hand side, the and or the or gate. The and steps must be completed in parallel or they must be completed in serial fashion, but they both must be completed to move on to the next step. The OR gate, any one of the objects below it can be completed. And then if you have an undeveloped event, like the one on the lower left-hand corner, like the disruption of an electronic security system, you may not know how that occurs. All you know is that it occurs to cause something. And then the lower right hand is just a continuation symbol from another page. These charts can be many, many pages long. So here's a very, very simple example that I'll walk you through. Starting on the lower right hand corner, you have the defeat of vault locks. An individual can take that, and if they defeat that lock, what does it mean with the and or the or gate? What is that triangular? Do they have to do all three or just one? Just one. They can either use off shift entry, they can thieve the A and the B keys, or they can defeat the vault locks. The second step, the second level where it says disruption of electronic security system, that's an unknown event. We don't know how they would do that. We may need to define that in the future. But that would need to be done in parallel with the defeat of the administrating and accounting systems. Once they do those two, we could lose material. And so that tells you where you're vulnerable. This would indicate that we need to make sure our accounting systems have been documented and that our security systems are inaccessible to outsiders. Let's talk about these two. Just a few more minutes and we'll, we'll wrap it up. Threats and vulnerability assessments. So if we look at our facilities, we look at the bad guys, they must be pulled together at some time. And every single one of our threats must be documented with specific elements in our security system which stop them. For example, a vehicle bomb. What elements do we have on our perimeter that disrupt or slow or stop that attack from being successful? Uh, I worked with uh, Roger Johnston, who is now at uh, Argonne National Laboratory. He was at Los Alamos. And his, one of his famous sayings was that you don't know all of your vulnerabilities in your system. But if you know your own vulnerabilities better than the adversary, you've got a shot at understanding who could attack them. There is no way you will ever know all of the, the threats to your system or your own vulnerabilities. But once you do know your own vulnerabilities, then you can hypothesize what bad things can be done to you. Uh, here's a, a description of the vulnerability assessment process. As I mentioned before, you look at targets, you look at the threats, 
And then you start the negotiations with the facility managers. We know these bad guys could do this to your system. What do you want us to do about it? And we'll come up with a few scenarios, and you bless those scenarios, and then we'll test your system to see if it can withstand direct attack. So that as we describe your facility, and as we scope your facility, that we understand what your pro force is and what they do, and then we determine the pathways that can be used to attack you. And we'll develop scenarios and determine if your pro force, or protection force, can interrupt and or neutralize that threat. If it's effective, you don't need to upgrade. You're good. If not, upgrades should be made. It's very rare that you have a system that actually can withstand the threat. So this is basically a restatement of what I talked about before with the eventual goal, with the bullet second to the bottom, of determining the system effectiveness. You need to determine how effective or ineffective your system is and scale that on a scale of 0 to 1. 1 being completely ineffective, 0 being not effective. This is the end of Module 1, and see you back in a few minutes for Module 2.